What we're going to discuss today is the well-founded universe of sets. So this is the final chapter in the, in the lecture series. <clears throat> At the very beginning, I said I wasn't going to actually define what it really was to be a set. We were going to leave that kind of vague as we went through the course, and we were going to think about more and more properties of sets as we produced more and more axioms. So we've now completed the list of axioms. So we can actually now define exactly what it is that's going to be the universe of mathematical discourse. And this is the sort of the so-called V hierarchy. It's the universe of well-founded sets. So we're going to be able to draw a picture. Actually, it's just like the one over my shoulder here. It's a draw a cone of sets. And the idea is that there are the ordinals growing up the middle of this cone. And off the ordinals, we iterate the power set operation. So we saw this at the beginning in the first, <coughs> first week where we talked about VNs. Well, now we have the mechanism of the machinery of ordinals. So we can actually expand that idea into the transfinite. And what we find is that any set that a mathematician needs occurs somewhere during this, this hierarchy at some level or other. So that's the intention here for today. So let's start then at uh, definition 6.1. So this is called the well-founded hierarchy of sets. And for reasons that are obvious, it's also called the V hierarchy or the V alpha hierarchy or some such here. <clears throat> so what we're going to do is we define a function by transfinite recursion. on alpha. So as a function, it's going to go from alpha to V alpha, like this. And start in case we start out with the empty set. And now not just Vn plus one, but V alpha plus one, this will be the power set of V alpha here. And then at limit ordinals, we take the union of the things we've got so far. Here. So as I've said, it's kind of traditional to kind of draw a cone or at least a V-shape of sets like this here. And I think of the ordinals as running up the middle. And hanging off the ordinals as we go these layers here. So V0 down there at the bottom, we start out with the empty set and we've seen what the VNs look like. And then V omega, we take to be the union of the VNs. And then V omega plus one, according to this recipe, is the power set of V omega. And then there's going to be omega plus two and so on. There's going to be a V omega plus omega. And then all of those ordinals that we've looked at, the countable ordinals, there's going to be Vs corresponding to those. And then there's going to be when we get to omega one, it'll be V sub omega one. And then the next level is the power set of that and so on. 
So what we'll be doing is investigating the properties of this V hierarchy to begin with. So I hope the picture at least there is um, reasonable. So the first thing to note is that it accumulates. Right? So as we go up, we get more and more things, which is kind of obvious from this, this power set um, idea here. But lemma 6.2, outlines this. So for any alpha, we have a couple of properties. The alpha is transitive. And the second property is if beta is less than alpha, the beta is a member of the alpha. And hence, by one, V to V is a subset of the alpha. So the thing grows as we go up. And okay, this proof. So we prove both facts simultaneously by transfinite induction on alpha. So when alpha equals zero, again, as usual, it's kind of trivial. V zero is the empty set, which is transitive. If any number is less than the zero, then V of it is in V zero. It's vacuously true because there are no numbers less than zero. So there's nothing to do there. So we let alpha be beta plus one and assume that 6.2 is true for beta. In other words, that V beta is transitive and any beta prime less than beta, V beta prime is in V beta and V beta prime is a subset of V beta. So what we do is we use If X is transitive, then so is its power set. So this is an exercise back in chapter one. So this is going to mean if <clears throat> V beta is transitive, which we're assuming it is by the inductive hypothesis, V beta's power set is transitive. But that's just what V alpha is. V alpha is the power set of V beta. <clears throat> so by the inductive hypothesis, V beta is transitive. And since, so we also get this, but this is, the statement that V alpha is transitive.
as V alpha is the power set of V beta, by definition. Okay, so we finished one when alpha equals beta plus one. Holds for alpha or V alpha. So V beta here is an element of the power set of V beta. So V beta is a member of V alpha. Because we've just shown V alpha is transitive, <coughs> V beta is a subset of V alpha. Okay, so that shows two for when alpha equals beta plus one. I mean, actually some people make the mistake of stopping there, right? But what we have to show is for every beta less than alpha, V beta is in V alpha. All I've just done here is show that this particular V beta is in V alpha where alpha equals beta plus one. I mean, it's not, it's not a problem, right? But something else has to be said. If beta prime is less than beta, then by the inductive hypothesis, okay, I've got that V beta prime is a member of V beta. I've just shown V beta is a subset of V alpha. Hence V beta prime is a member of V alpha. So I've just made the remark that for all smaller beta primes, these are also in alpha. And again, the transitivity alpha means they're subsets. Or indeed, Again, the, the inductive hypothesis, V beta prime is a subset of V beta, right? Which we've seen as a subset of V alpha. So there's two ways you can say this last bit. So that completes the case when alpha is a successor. So this completes one and two. And now we have lastly when it offers a limit. So none of, the, none of this is difficult. It's just laying out the reasons correctly. Then the alpha is the union of the betas, the V betas. By the inductive hypothesis, these are all transitive. So the union of transitive sets is transitive. So V alpha is transitive. as the union of transitive sets is transitive, then V alpha is transitive. Again, we're using the inductive hypothesis that the V betas are transitive.
किया Then V beta alpha implies right, that V beta is a member of V alpha holds. Since alpha is a limit, right, so beta plus one or any gamma between beta and alpha here phi beta is a member of it. Since phi beta is a member of V beta plus one, again by the inductive hypothesis, and so V beta plus one is one of the things going into this union so V beta is in V alpha. So again, any smaller beta, <clears throat> I've got V beta as a member of V alpha. And then again, by transitivity, I've got V beta as a subset of V alpha. And we're finished. Could you move the page up a little bit? Sure. Okay, so we're done. So I did that quite slowly and carefully, right? There. So I hope that's that's went over okay. In your proofs, when you have the forward implication arrows, sometimes you do it with two lines and sometimes you do it with one. I'm wondering if there's any difference to you. I mean, here like this, not really, no. Um, I'm just, I'm just lazy. Um, I mean, there is there is sometimes a a difference. I think, you know, if this was a more formal course and we were talking about the language of set theory and the logical structure of our sentences or something, I would use a single arrow in here. <clears throat> I mean, a single tailed arrow in here. Um, I would tend to use the double thing is kind of more informal. And here, and the single one here is, this is part of our formal language. But this isn't really a, a course in the formal, I mean, you may think it's kind of very formal and abstract, but it can be more formal and abstract than this. This isn't part of our formal language. We're not, I'm not insisting that we write things down in a formal language way. Right? If I did, I'd make some distinction between these two. But um, here I am in the habit of writing this single tail arrow because this is part of my formal language, which I express sets in. And perhaps if I've got an equivalence in proofs, I would use this thing. Does that answer it? I mean, that's... Yeah, thank you. But it's not, it's not, I mean, for you or for your answers, it's not, it's not a big deal. Okay. Let's go back to our picture. <clears throat> so the claim will be that uh, this V constitutes a uh, kind of a universe of sets for the mathematical discourse. Well, one of the usefulnesses of this picture is that every set appears at some stage and something gets into V because it's the union of the all of the V alphas here. 
So something gets in at some stage. So this gives us a kind of ranking or grading or filtration on the elements of V. We can associate to, to each set in V the alpha where it first appears. Definition 6.3. So this is called the rank function. For which we use the Greek letter R, the row. For any X in V, row X is at least tall So that X is a subset of V tor. So again, to go back to the, to have a fresh picture. So the idea is that the elements of X are all in V tor. So they themselves may, they will occur at earlier levels. I don't know what, you know, it's spread out here. And when we've got all of the elements of X, right, listed as it were, or arranged or occurring in this V hierarchy before stage tor, I can say X is a subset of tor. So the rank of X is the least tor such that X is a subset of it. Of course, VTOR is a subset of larger VTOR primes. So if X is a subset of VTOR, it's a subset of any larger VTOR prime. But the rank is the least place. So we kind of picture the elements of X as appearing for at least stage two, the rank, and then X appears. Because it's a subset of VTOR, and VTOR plus one is the power set of VTOR, So here's a subset of VTOR, X is a member of VTOR plus one. And conversely, anything that's a member of VTOR plus one, of course, is a subset of VTOR. So if it's in VTOR plus one, its rank is less than or equal to TOR. So the rank of Y, according to this definition, is less than or equal to tor. And I said any Y that's in here, it might be that Y appears, Y might be just a set of integers. It might appear just, it might be a subset of the omega. So its rank is less than or equal to tor here. So this is why we sort of think of it as a cumulative hierarchy of sets. The elements of a set appear and then the set itself appears. And this, notice also, this means if I've got an element of X, which has got rank tor, that element of X, that Y say, this occurs at some earlier stage. Y is a member of X, then for this particular X, Y is a member of VTOR. And again, 
what we were just arguing here, if it's a member of VTOR, its rank is less than or equal to tor. Its elements occur somewhere earlier. So in general, if U is a member of Z, then the rank of U is less than the rank of Z. Okay. But being a member, strict less than here. Okay, so I hope that um, picture is coming over. So this means in the end that the rank function is so-called well-founded function, well-founded relation on set. So the rank function leads to this less than relation, which is a well-founded relation on sets. So let's see what that, that means. So RUV, which means that <laughs> U and V are sets in the hierarchy and the rank of U is less than the rank of V. I made the comment is a well-founded relation on sets. Now, we haven't discussed well-founded relations a lot, <laughs> only in the form of well-ordered relations. So a well-ordered relation is basically a well-founded relation, which is a strict total order. So a well-founded relation can look like a tree rather than things being arranged in a line. But it has this the well-foundedness property. So the R here, this is a partial order. Well, in fact, it's a strict partial order. Which is well founded. That is, if I take any non empty subset of the field of this relation here. here contained in V, then there is a R least element of X. And what does R least mean? It means that its rank is least. That is, there is some u0 in x so that <clears throat> for all v in x, rank of u0 is minimal here. What we're doing here is putting an order on the places where the sets in our X occur. So some set occurs first. That's all that's being said here. Right? Maybe many sets occur at some least alpha stage, but there is some U0. 
that occurs right, right, no later than all of the others. Right? So it's not a strict total order. There may be many u in x with a rank of u the same as rank of zero. This is the difference between just being a partial order and being a total order. The difference then in this case is between being a well-founded relation and a well-ordering. <clears throat> I mean, this is slightly more abstract now, but this is one uses this when one says you've got a collection of sets and you want to pick one out. So I can use the rank function and just say I'll take an X whose rank is least. We use this in the following way. Suppose we have a collection of sets X. Then we can pick out a, a set as above. You use zero in X, and I'll just say with least rank. And that'll mean just this, that anything in X has a rank greater or equal to, the, to it. Okay, so let's see some, see what kind of sets appear and where in the hierarchy. So these are the examples, bottom of page 61. So again, my ordinals, <clears throat> here's X, perhaps a subset of VTOR. Here are its elements. So actually I'll stick with alpha because that's what's stated in the examples. X is a member of V alpha. So so suppose I have an X and its rank is alpha. That means it's a subset of E alpha and alpha is least here. Then Think about singleton X here. This is a subset of V alpha. Sorry, this is a subset of the next level. Right? Sorry. Then consider Singleton X here. This is a subset of the alpha plus one, right? right? Remember, X is a subset of the alpha means X is an element of the alpha plus one. This is the singleton set with X in, so this is a subset of the alpha plus one. So X is a subset of the alpha plus one, <clears throat> the singleton set. So here I've got X appearing all the way up here with all of its elements. Now this set, right, 
call it Z if you like. This has just got one element. Right? And where did that one element appear? Right? <clears throat> it's a subset of V alpha, but actually it appears as an element in V alpha plus one. So X is an element in the V hierarchy appears as an element of V alpha plus one. And so the Z is a subset of V alpha plus one. Hence the rank of Z <clears throat> is less than or equal to alpha plus one. So the least place where it's a subset is here alpha plus one. But the rank of Z is not less than alpha plus one right here. Since this is the rank of the singleton set X here. And if the rank of Z was something less than alpha plus one, Let's suppose it was some tor less than alpha plus one. <clears throat> We'd have that the rank of X was less than tor. We've already agreed by this note above. If U is a member of a set Z, then the rank of U is less than the rank of Z. So this is the Z in that comment. If this is the rank is here is tor, X is an element of this. So the rank of X is less than the rank of this. But the rank of X here is alpha. So the rank of this here alpha is less than the rank of this. So all that's left is that it's alpha plus one. Which is what I start. I started calling this Z. So the picture is: if I've got a set of a certain rank, <clears throat> I look. I put brackets around it, and I raise the rank by one. So sorry. This is. Let's make this clear then. <clears throat> Okay, repeating this. If I look at the singleton of the singleton set of X, this is going to have rank alpha plus two. That'll occur at the next level. Each time I put a brackets, pair of brackets around something, I increase its rank by one. Right. So it's time you put a pair of brackets around the set, creating a new set, the rank goes up. So suppose I've got two things, X and Y, whose rank is alpha. <clears throat> if 
then we can consider the, the pair set, unordered pair set X and Y. Okay, so both X and Y, right, they're subsets of this V alpha. <clears throat> Here's the layer V alpha. Then what we have is that both of these two here, right, if their rank is alpha, this implies that X and Y are members of the alpha plus one. Right? So this set is a subset of the alpha plus one. And just for singleton set X, it can't be a subset of anything smaller. So just for singleton set X above, this can't be less than alpha plus one because it would make the rank of X less than alpha. So just to repeat that argument. So the rank is exactly alpha plus one. So again, this is an example of me putting a pair of brackets around things of rank alpha, and it ends up having rank alpha plus one. So we can continue then with this uh, with this game here. What is the rank of the ordered pair X and Y? Well, recall X, Y, is this. Right, we've just computed the ranks of this and this. They're alpha plus one. Right? According to the maxim above, then this should have rank alpha plus two. Okay. So we'll just check that the maxim works. But what are the singleton X and this doubleton X, Y, right? right? Each of these here is an element of V alpha plus one. So what we have here is a subset of V alpha plus one. Sorry. Um, sorry, no, this isn't correct. No, I'm just, let's back up. What have we got here? Singleton X is, again, this is an element of um, the alpha plus two, as is the pair x, y. So this set is a subset of the alpha plus two. So the rank of x, y is
again, is less than or equal to alpha plus two. But the same reasoning as before shows that it can't be less than. It's not strictly less than alpha plus two. Again, because if it were, it would mean that the ranks of singleton x or this doubleton set x, y would be less than alpha plus one, which it isn't. So let me, I'll say that perhaps for the last time here then. If it were strictly less than alpha plus two, So this would force the rank of this, or the rank of x, y here, to be strictly less than alpha plus one, which they're not. So the ranks, the elements of the set, of course, force the rank of the set up and up. So this gives us, we can then start thinking about, you know, where Cartesian products of things appear. If I know that if X and Y are subsets of V alpha, then this ordered pair is a subset of V alpha plus two. I could start thinking about where ordered, uh, where Cartesian products are going to appear. Right, so, um, well, it's perhaps a bit confusing because I used alpha up there. Let's call this betas here. Let's look at V betas. So what is this? This is the collection of ordered pairs X, Y, right here, for X and Y in V beta. Well, we've seen if X and Y are in V beta, right? Then the ordered pair X, Y here is in V beta plus two. So everything here is a subset of VB plus two. And so I can then say some other, other things. If everything in this Cartesian product is contained in R beta plus two, in VB plus two, if I think of an ordering on V beta, that's a subset of V beta cross V beta. So that's also a subset of V beta plus two as well. Any ordering or relation on V beta, let's call it R, say, 
and R is a subset of V beta cross V beta. That's also going to be here a subset of V beta plus two. So the rank of any relation on V beta right, is going to be less than or equal to V beta plus two. Over here. So this says, okay, our relations on our V betas are also going to occur not too far away from V beta. They'll all occur by V beta plus two. Okay, so look at exercise 6.1. I'm going to set it for this week, right? So you're in a position to look at this one now. And this asks you to compute various other ranks of objects. Okay, so there'll be more about this next time.